呃各位好啊，呃，今天啊、呃、这个这个什么呃第二天的讨论呢，呃我在想说，呃好像开始进入更呃紧急的区域啊区块来进行讨论哈、啊。那么我们第一场呢，呃，请到这个呃呃呃呃彭保罗先生呢，啊、呃，他实际上是呃，就是说、呃、法国的学者，但是呢，来在台湾现在是中研院呃社会呃研究所，那么他的主要的研究议题呢，是在。环绕在东亚这边几个国家的，呃，跟环境有关系的，跟这个呃反抗运动有关系的这些研究主题这上面，那他对于台湾呢，算是相当熟悉而了解哈，啊，所以他其实今天呃，的题目哈，呃，呃，叫做敏感区域。呃，生态的脆弱性与公民抵抗，哈，那呃呃呃，就是说，呃，其实主要关注的焦点是在台湾的呃案例这上面，哈，台湾的这个呃呃环境的历史跟环境抗争的、呃、生态抗争的这些呃呃历史到，到到目前为止，哈，那当然大家熟悉，呃呃，最近几年，呃，台湾的状况的人呢，都了解说，呃呃呃，就是说。呃，生态环境的这一方面的反抗呢，事实上随时都在发生，啊，那么今天呢，实际上在台中呢，就有一场呃反空污的一个一个现场哈、哦，那么这个呃反空污的呃呃行动呢，事实上在呃这个月哈，十、哦、一月三号就在台北举行了一场。十一号呢，呃，在台高雄哈、啊，又举行第二场。那今天呢，啊，是在高雄，呃，是在台中，好、啊。那实际上呢，就是说，呃，这就涉及到一个很有趣的一个问题，就是说，我们今天呢，呃，如何来界定什么叫做敏感区域？好、啊，那也就是说，我们的敏感区域呢，事实上已经。扩散到整个星星的这个表面，地球的一个表面，而不再只是零星的坐落在某一些呃呃小的区域而已哈。那我想这个是今天讨论敏感区域的时候啊，我们要了解的一个一个一个一个状况哈。它不再是一个零星的小区域，而实际上是片星啊。遍布在整个星球的啊，本身就是这个地球本身就是敏感区域哈。那我想用这样子作为一个开头呢啊，那我们今天请这个什么保罗先生呢啊，来给我们做这个哈、啊、他的演讲啊。哎，好 ，Thank you， 谢谢你，谢谢徐先生的介绍。嗯，我我会用英文讲，所以呃。如果你的英文跟我差不多，呃，意思说马马虎虎，我建议你们用那个设计，因为啊、呃，我我的英文有蛮强的英文口音。<笑> First of all, I would like to thank curator Umali and Francesco Manacoda and the Taipei Fine Arts Museum for giving me this occasion and of、uh, of this talk. Um, Umali and Francesco Manacoda kindly invited me to share with you my research about environmental mobilization in Taiwan. Last year, when、uh, in this museum we had uh, invited uh, French sociologist Bruno Latour、uh, for a series of lecture in Taiwan, and one of it, one of which, what was in this museum,、uh, with Umali among others. And、um, and then Bruno Latour and I、uh, we visited the, the outdoor research centers of geologists in Taroko, Taroko, and it was a fascinating experience. So I, for this paper, I propo I propose to follow on the discussion we had at that at that time here in in Fine Art Museum and also in Taroko, and.、Um, I will bring some additional examples borrowed to my fieldwork in Taiwan to discuss how ecological vulnerability interact with democratic resistance. I find useful to borrow the notion of critical zone, Dongwen Shi Mingan Chu, as defined by Bruno Latour, who himself borrows it from geologists. 
I think this, is, this concept fits quite well with the context of Taiwan and beyond Taiwan for our epoch. But first of all, what, when we think about the relationship between ecology and democracy, um, what the fuck, <laughs> if I may, sorry for this, I'm polite. Um, what I mean is a political ecology as emphasized our ecology is necessarily political. Many works stress, for instance, that environment, Huanjing, is, it means an environment, a marge, a periphery. Uh, in other words, it's not a priority. So this, this may explain why um, the world political and economic elites are not so uh, efficient in, or not so, um, um, they have been so slow in addressing the world ecological crisis. But why should ecology care about democracy? Tigers are not democrat. Um, my, uh, in Taiwan, uh, my friend He Mingxiu uh, has uh, published a book uh, called Green Democracy, Lu Min Zhu. And it was a few years ago, but nowadays uh, we have scholars, uh, specialists of China, who argue that uh, ch so-called China's green authoritarianism is much more efficient than Taiwan um, green democracy in dealing with, uh, for example, air pollution or this sort of thing. Well, I don't share this point of view. I think uh, democracy uh, is important for addressing the ecological crisis. Um, for the last 20 years, Bruno Latour has aimed to bring nature into democracy because the ecological crisis is not only about humans, as he argues through the notion of the parliament of things, res publica in Latin, um, the republic. Non-human things and animals should be given a vote. But as he shows, political ecology is blocked by an attachment to naturalism a false divide made by modernity between nature and society, politics and science, science and religion. In that sense, Latour was probably among the first ecological thinker to go beyond nature, to redefine the nature of nature, or to post-naturalize nature, to borrow the, the, the title of this um, exhibition. Recently, uh, Latour has emphasized the need to reset modernity, starting with a reset of geopolitics. For Latour, our current vision of geopolitics is still dependent on a narrow, very narrow conception of nation-state sovereignties, the so-called Westphalian regime. For Latour, Uh, for Latour, this old daddy sort of geopolitics is unfit to cope with the tremendous challenges of the current ecological crisis. Latour invites to go beyond the boundaries of nation states. As he argues, the old geopolitics is a view from above the sky. Uh, like, you know, the first pictures taken by astronauts of the so-called blue planet. Uh, these sorts of views from above are misleading on what the Earth really means. Latour argues that the special, sh the special shuttle of geopolitics need to do a landing, to get down to Earth, to land on the ground floor. I take an example of mine. Uh, if you use Google Earth, uh, Google Earth or Google Map, you, it may be useful to find a way where, where you want to go to make a trip, but it, when, it won't tell you, uh, for example, how much plastics are into the ocean, uh, eaten by turtles, and so on. So the notion of critical zone is, um, so Latour borrowed this notion from geologists, and um, published uh, an article, very interesting, in, in a uh, journal of geology, actually, 
where he explained why this concept is interesting for geopolitics. And uh, if you remember, in Greek, uh, geo means the earth, uh, and uh, Latour thinks that geologists have an, a very deep, fine grade and inside view of what that earth means. And the notion of Anthropocene, by the way, refers to a new geological epoch. So it is therefore no surprise that geologists uh, have been passionate, passionate by the debate on uh, is it opportune to define our epoch as Anthropocene or not. So as to provoke an epistemic turn in the way we look at geopolitics, uh, Latour proposed to go down to earth and to follow geologists, in particular those geologists who study the critical zone. Geologists define the critical zone as a layer, a thin layer of the earth, which is only a dozen kilometers thick. It is the part of the earth which is most vulnerable to climate change and the current ecological crisis. Thus, at the inch between geology and ecology. Not John and the on the critical zone, find Mingan Chu, this is the uh, uh, from an ecological point of view, Taiwan is a very vulnerable place, a critical zone in the critical zone. According to the German Watch Institute, Taiwan, or Chinese Taipei, ranks number seven in the top 10 of the climate risk index that identify the countries most exposed to climate change related disaster. And number 10 is, uh, are the United States, we can call it English Washington. Um, climate change um, as also another person. Taiwan ranks also number 54 out of 57 nations in the climate change performance index due to its poor performance on reducing carbon emissions and other greenhouse gases. In other words, Taiwan is both a victim and a perpetrator of climate change. So we just cannot ignore the ecological question. Not all the ecologist activists in Taiwan are equally aware of that problem, but uh, some of my colleagues have argued that uh, for the last, uh, recently, for the last period, uh, there was an epistemic turn from anti-pollution fight to uh, climate change, mobilization for climate change policies. Um, so last year, um, I, um, I went to Taroko Valley with uh, Bruno Latour and here, and we were invited by geologist Niels Ovius. He's uh, a Dutch guy, from, but he, he teaches in Germany in a very uh, famous uh, institute of earth science called GFZ in Potsdam. And uh, with his colleagues from Potsdam and uh, also the America and in Taiwan, National Taiwan University and um, in, in Hualien, National Donghua University, um, they have con they are conducted. They, they have just started uh, last year. This launch a very ambitious research project. So. As Niels Obvious explained to Bruno and I, uh, Taiwan is at the crossroads of three tectonic plates. So this is, uh, this is uh, Niels uh, drawing. So actually, mostly is this plate, the Philippine, uh, the, uh, Philippine Sea plate, uh, or the Pacific plate, and the Asian plate. And there is another plate, which is uh, the China Sea plate and the Okinawa plate. But mostly is one and two, and accessorily another two. So, depending ge geology, all the geologists, uh, it it is debated among geologists. Uh, but uh, at least Taiwan is at the bit in between two fault lines, or perhaps no two plates or two two or four plates. So, 
it's very uh, the seismic activity is 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 extremely intense and geologists call that a destructive plate boundary destructive plate boundary when, when i realized i was living on a destructive plate boundary i felt like wow it's really frightening and uh, so this is the seismic activity and in addition to that taiwan is located in in tropical or subtropical zone which means that it also suffers from uh, um, typhoons and heavy rains and those typhoons and heavy rains are have been increased uh, the intensity has been increased by climate change so we have the conjunction of a very intense seismic activity and uh, and a strong uh, um, exposure to uh, uh, any, uh, hard exposure to typhoons and heavy rains. Climate change makes this initial situation even more critical. So it explains why Taiwan is a vulnerable place, a critical zone in the critical zone. And if you think in places like the Taroko Valley, um, we can think we have even a critical zone within the critical zone. So the first lever is critical zone, what geologists usually uh, mean by critical zone is this layer of the earth. But if you think as Taiwan as a hot spot in, in the earth, a hot spot of critical zone, and Taiwan is here, and you, you have some hot spots in the critical zone. So I think we can think different layers of the critical zone. Landslides are the most visible uh, consequence of this um, um, uh, critical zone, but um, erosion and um, flux of, of the movement of sediments is, is another consequence. Uh, for example, this, uh, as Niels explained to us, 10 years ago, this rock was plain, and within 10 years, it be the, the, now there is a big hole. And so, as Niels obviously explained, this is very, very intense in Taiwan. He has been to many places in the world, but he says, in Taiwan, I can observe phenomenon that it takes me much more time in other places of the world, even in Nepal or New Guinea. So Taiwan is really, really intense. So this is also the consequence of uh, heavy, ra heavy rain. Um, so their project uh, consists of uh, light um, outdoor observation station like this one so here you have the anon anemometer to measure the wind and, the, and also a, an, um, an equipment to measure rain um, here you have a camera to film 24 hours a day the movement of the mountains if there is any landslide or rock falling this sort of thing there is also a captor to measure the movement of the river, the intensity of the, of the, of the how do you call that? Uh, the discharge is, um, well, basically the water flow. And here you have a, a seismic, met seismic meter to measure the seismic activity. Uh, they also conduct some, do some measurements inside the mountain, so they are really uh, at the earth, uh, at the earth of, uh, of the of the earth. <laughs> As a consequence of intense erosion, uh, this Buddhist temple, I'm sure you know the place. It's a very uh, famous touristic spot. This is in Tianxiang. Mm. Uh, this Buddhist temple threatens to collapse. Right. The mountain here is, is about to collapse. And this is probably ineluctable. Ineluctable. But as a mean to postpone as a mean to postpone postpon that event, the local authorities have decided to destroy the big rocks on the river, so on the opposite side, and to move them on this side as a mean to you know to reinforce the, the, the basement of this mountain. And Niels told me that it was, this was, this is uh, absolutely useless. One chair may or young. But uh, so I think it's kind of useless geopolitics. It's, it's bad geopolitics. Um, 
at the entrance of the Taroko Valley, so the Taroko Valley starts around here, uh, uh, on this picture, Neil's uh, ob uh, ob observation session will be around here, and here you have the, you know, the Asia Cement Mine, which threatens to collapse on the, on the communities, Aboriginal communities of Taroko people who are there. Um, environmental, so this is another view from, from the mine up to the sea. Um, environmental activists um, have been protesting for decades uh, um, with the villagers of those communities. They have been protesting for decades against the nuisance caused by the mine and the huge risk it imposes on the villager. Their mobilization has been hindered by the company's tricks to manipulate the villagers with monthly allowances for electricity fees or this kind of things. But actually those villagers who are employed at the mines, um, only a few of them are regular employees. You know, most of them are contract workers. They do the most dangerous and dirty jobs. But the mine has been using them to argue that uh, the mine is important for the economic activity, etc. And uh, if the mine closed, they will lose their job and this sort of thing. Um, in June 2017, uh, uh, documentary uh, director Chibolin uh, died in a helicopter crash not far from the mine. Um, and uh, this caused uh, um, a big emotion in Taiwan because, uh, as you know, he's famous for his movie uh, uh, Beyond Beauty. Uh, um, Taiwan film from above, um, and his death brought more attention on the case, on the issue of Asia cement. Uh, so then thousands of people gathered in Taipei to protest uh, against the mine and uh, for the revision, drastic revision of the uh, mine law. Um, Actually, it was shocking that a few, year, a f a few months before, uh, about the time I visited the mine with Bruno and, and Niels, um, the, um, the mine has just been granted by the uh, uh, Ministry of Economics the permit to continue to dig the mountain for another 20 years um, without any um, environmental impact assessment. So this was really shocking. Actually, um, among the 200 uh, also mining areas in Taiwan, 80% are in Aboriginal territory. And while Aborigines make up only 2% of the population, their communities bear most of the losses in the f um, uh, due to typhoons, floods, and landslides. Typhoon Morakot was probably the most striking case of injustice suffered by Aboriginal people faced to climate change related disaster or what we could call also a uh, post-nature disaster. Um, another famous case is the, um, the nuclear waste uh, stored in Orchid Island, also a place for Aboriginal people. Uh, a, a case I've been involved in for many years is the Taiwan RCA. There's no, uh, the victims are not Aboriginal, but they are former female workers of a factory. And actually, it started as an environmental issue, and before it becomes an occupational hazards case. Um, the lawsuits, we just got uh, last August a very good uh, decision, uh, well, no, very good decision why by the High Court last year, and uh, last August we got the decision from the Supreme Court. It's not so bad, but we have to go back to High Court for further uh, debate. But it's long battle for justice, and I think it, it carries many um, important meanings for other victims of environmental injustice in the world. Another interesting case um, where, uh, which I have been involved in is the um, protest, the mobilization we have launched in Taiwan with uh, Vietnamese migrant workers for the victims of the marine disaster caused by Formosa plastic in Taiwan, in Vietnam, sorry.
So, um, at this stage of my talk, I would like to introduce another notion, um, or what I call a civic eco-nationalism, and how it interacts with the China factor. Um, a good witness and representative of this particular form of eco-nationalism can be found in the public television weekly broadcast, Our Island, Woman the Da. Um, the founding producer is Ko Jin Yuan, who will speak later in the afternoon, as, and he has uh, also a booth in this exhibition. As Ko Jin Yuan and his colleagues explained to me, the original idea with uh, the broadcast title, Woman the Da, uh, Our Island, aimed to express a strong wish to protect the island against all sorts of environmental destruction, starting with industrial big polluters like Formosa plastic or Asia cement. This sort of environmental protection, Huan Pao, thus carries a strong sense of nationalism. Protecting the environment implies protecting the nation and its vulnerable democracy. Yes, I found, yet I found this eco-nationalism not exclusive or xenophobic, um, because as Ko Jin Yuan explained in the case of our island, from its very beginning of the broadcast, an important goal was to explore the seashore and ocean life. During the martial law, Taiwanese could not approach seashore and go to the sea, which is a paradox for Icelanders. This openness to the ocean, as well as the experience of foreign countries, is still vivid in the broadcast of uh, uh, Women Ta. And also the mobilization I, I just uh, mentioned, uh, for example, the fact that uh, um, uh, Taiwanese of Han descent, of Chinese descent, um, go hand in hand with Aboriginal people, or the fact that uh, foreigners like me um, uh, and our Vietnamese migrants are very much welcome in those mobilization for me is um, a strong sign of openness to the world. So I mean this, ec uh, this eco-nationalism is not exclusive, it's inclusive. And I think this is quite important. And this is, this is why I call it a civic eco-nationalism. Uh, this notion of eco-nationalism was introduced in the literature on environmental politics by um, American uh, politist Jane Dawson in her study of post chernobyl Soviet Union. As she analyzed after the, after the nuclear disaster of 1986 in Chernobyl, anti-nuclear mobilizations emerged all over the USSR. But after the mutation of the USSR, um, these, uh, these anti-nuclear mobilization just disappeared. So just a very uh, brief period of time. Uh, but meanwhile, this anti-nuclear mobilization has fueled uh, players um, a significant role in the birth of um, 14 new republics. And, and, and in addition, uh, to the USSR transforming in a uh, federation of Russia and 14 republics. So, as Dawson explained, in that case, uh, the ecology is like a surrogate cause for nationalism. It's just a pretext for, mobilizi for mo mobilizing, uh, for protesting, but for, for other purposes, nationalism. Um, so, what lesson for Taiwan? I think this analysis draws several insights um, for the current situation of Taiwan. In Taiwan, the situation is not to gain independence because we have uh, de facto independence. What we just need is a de jure independence. But at least uh, the main problem now is how to preserve independence from China. And then uh, if you think of uh, what ecology, uh, what uh, what, the, what, what may be the role of ecology in, in that uh, kind of geopolitics. Uh, I argue that Huang Pao, in context of Taiwan, is a way of protecting, uh, it's a way of meaning, perhaps not, re not consciously, but I think it's a way of meaning, uh, we want to protect our cute, Taiwan is a cute little democracy, and we want to protect it from big predators like China. Um, uh, 
My colleague uh, Ojemin at uh, Academia Seneca has named um, uh, the, the China factor as the fault line of environment of politics in Taiwan, but also I think of environmental politics. Um, the China factor plays a more important role in Taiwan than the left-right divide in other democracies, like in France, for example, the, the, the key notion is left and right. This is, uh, it exists also in Taiwan, but it's not as important as the China factor. So let me start with a, a short anecdote. In July 2017, a local NGO in Taiwan found that Greenpeace um, um, was mapping Taiwan as a part of China. So here is Taiwan and no difference with China. So uh, Taiwanese activists uh, criticized Greenpeace for using Taiwan to collect money from donators while showing no concern for Taiwan as a democracy threatened by China's authoritarian regime. So the China factor is like a fault line of Taiwan's eco-nationalism. Um, let me take a, uh, a bigger example, uh, more significant, is the case of air pollution. Uh, Xu Xianxian uh, just mentioned the, the, the mobilization in Taichung. Um, uh, this was uh, a demonstration two years ago in Taichung, actually. Uh, and at that time, the slogan was Yige Tian Kong, Younger Taiwan. I think it shows that uh, Taiwan was kind of divided between, there, there is a, um, as if the south of Taiwan was kind of a, a new colony of the north. Uh, so most of the resources of the wealth are located in, 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 in Taipei. And people of Taichung and Kaohsiung feel frustrated about that. So I think this slogan uh, expressed that uh, frustration. Um, however, um, ecologists, even those based in Taipei, I think work hand in hand with those based in Kaohsiung and Taichung. So as far as the environmental mobilization is concerned, I think there is a strong north-south solidarity. But uh, there is an outsider in the air pollution uh, debate, and I think this is a China factor. Um, not so obvious so far, but uh, let me explain what I mean here. Uh, big polluters like Formosa Plastic or China Steel or whatever, those uh, which are located in Taichung or Kaohsiung, um, when they want to, you know, discharge uh, uh, and refute their responsibility about air pollution, they say, uh, they will put the emphasis on on cars or bicycles. But sometimes they also argue, oh, you know, it's not us, it's China. The pollution coming from China. Um, a recent poll con conducted by my colleagues at uh, uh, um find out that the public opinion considers that uh, the China factor does play a role in, in air pollution in Taiwan, but still, most of people consider that the biggest responsibility uh, is to be put on industries or, or the government. But, well, it plays a role. Um, and the Taiwanese government has been paying attention to this China factor but it knows that it is better not to call in too much attention on this problem, otherwise environmental activists will criticize the government for using this as a pretext for inaction. Actually, there's quite a lot of scientific evidence on, on, on showing that uh, at least 20 or 30 percent of air pollution in Taiwan um, is due to um, uh, air pollutants from China, what the so-called transboundary, uh, or um, how they call that, long-range transport, that the uh, technical words they use to describe this. Um, Taiwanese and Chinese specialists of long-range transport air pollutants meet once or twice a, a year in Taiwan or in China, and they discuss about this issue. But as they told me, most of them told me, um, it's too sensitive to talk about the China uh, the, the air pollution from China to Taiwan. They, they tend to avoid this topic as too sensitive. Well, China, um, China of course, is, uh, cannot uh, voluntary, voluntarily 
release air pollutants against Taiwan. I mean, uh, these are very hard to control, and it's not like soldiers or missiles, you know. It, but um, I think, um, for example, if you consider the, um, the elections that are coming, I've noticed that the blue camp has been trying hard to turn green. Kuomintang uh, is. 比较我们叫泛滥,那个泛滥现在很尽量要把变成有我们也有律师那个口味。所以 the KMT has launched a referendum on the sake of the fight against air pollution. As if the fight against air pollution has always been a priority for the KMT and all the blame could be put on the DPP. Besides, in Gaoxiong, the DPP accuses the KMT candidate Han Guoyu of being sponsored by China. Like the fake news attack from China, this is probable, but very hard to prove, um, unless you are very good hackers. Um, but what I mean here is that the China factor is now entangled with the debate on air pollution. Um, another initiative for a re referendum aims to do green with nuclear, Yi He Yang Lu. This initiative was marked by a hunger strike by a former employee of KMT, former chairman, Hong Xiu Chu. It looks as if they were trying to reproduce in the opposite direction the performance of Li Yixiong, DPP former chairman, whose hunger strike against MPP4 in 2014 fueled a nationwide wave of anti-nuclear protest. So as a result, for the coming election next Saturday, we have a series of aggressive referendum launched by blue pro-nuclear conservatism and a defensive response from the green camp. It remains to be seen if these initiatives from the KMT will have a significant impact on environmental policies, but this greening of their image is quite a smart short-term tactic that might contribute to increase their vote share. And the fact is that the memory of the Fukushima nuclear disaster is fading. The commemoration of Fukushima on every March 11 uh, does not attract anymore the large crowds of protesters as from 2011 to 2015. You remember, this is what I call the Fukushima uh, 318 generation. Uh, what I mean here is that the, uh, between 2011 and 2014 and until the election in 2016, you had a strong move of anti-nuclear movement and in between you had this uh, Saiba, sunflower movement to protest against you know, the secret deals between the KMT and China. So I think here the anti-nuclear protest entangles with the I don't think it's anti-China, but I think it's uh, this feeling of protecting Taiwan as a vulnerable nation. So I think it's m maybe the most striking example of the, what I mean by a civic eco-nationalism. But this generation, maybe my generation, is graying uh, and, and maybe the memory of Fukushima is fading. Um, my colleagues uh, who work on China at the Institute of Sociology, like Wu Jiemin and others, have conducted, um, have been conducted polls on, on the attitude of Taiwanese toward China, China threat, Taiwan. Um, and um, for example, this question, uh, um, would you fight for Taiwan if China attacks? Um, although it, it has decreased uh, since uh, 2016, uh, still in 2000. 18, uh, the score was quite high. 66% uh, uh, are still ready to defend Taiwan in case of a Chinese aggression. Um, other questions show that the majority of people think that Taiwan would not have the capacity to resist against a military attack from China. Yet, an amazing, an amazing majority of people wish to maintain a civil or military system of at least one year of service. Um, and other questions show a strong commitment for democracy. Though this polls does show a puzzling mix of defeatism and a strong will to defend the country. This sounds apparently contradictory. 
But it suggests that our Taiwanese care about their vulnerable democracy. So to conclude my presentation on a more colorful vision, uh, let me bring you uh, to Dongsha Atoll. This atoll is located in what Taiwan calls the South Sea and what China calls the South China Sea. It takes one hour by plane from Kaohsiung to go there and only soldiers and researchers can, can go there. So uh, researchers are Taiwanese and various nationalities except Chinese. Um, it's not a xenophobic measure, it's uh, mili for military, uh, obvious military reason. Last summer, I had the opportunity to stay there one week with specialists of marine biology um, uh, from Taiwan, uh, Japan, America, and Malaysia. Uh, despite of the Chinese threat and the army soldiers around in, in the island, the atmosphere is rather relaxed. It, basically, it looks like a, a scout camp. Uh, uh, the soldiers and the researchers, most of them are very young, and uh, yeah, so it's quite relaxed. But, you know, still you have the soldiers with guns, so, uh, well. <laughs> and, um, well, I guess the spirit is, is quite different in the man-made island that China uh, is now building, you know, 1,000 uh, uh, kilometers further south in, in the South China Sea. Um, uh, but I can't tell you much about this because uh, uh, we, we share the, the, our meals with the soldiers, but most of, our, of my time I was with the researchers, so I don't know much about the soldier situation, but um, um, what is for sure, uh, those, uh, those guys are conducting uh, pretty cool research, and I would like to introduce some of it. Uh, for instance, these Taiwanese students are observing the movement of hermit crabs. <coughs> hermit crabs, sorry. And it's fascinating. Um, researchers from University of California at San Diego, the Scripps is a museum of oceanography, have a, a big project of observing 100 islands all over the world. And Dongsha in Taiwan, they there is Dongsha, Lanyu, and uh, I forgot, there is uh, two others, uh, Kenting and, and Penghu. So, so four of these 400 challenge are in Taiwan. And in Dongsha, what is remarkable is uh, in 1998, uh, like the totality of corals died because of El Nino, you know, the, the, uh, the, the warm, uh, uh, what's the phenomenon? And um, so the totality of corals died, but um, over the years, so 20 years later, um, uh, they say that uh, 30, between 30 and 40 percent of the corals colony have resurrected. So, hallelujah. Mm. It's quite a good news, actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, but something very sad uh, is that uh, is the amount of plastic waste that you can find on the beaches there. Um, uh, most of it from uh, Taiwan, uh, Taiwan, China, um, but as far as Japan and Korea from the north and Thailand from the south. So um, with the help of uh, the soldiers, uh, the researchers have collected this waste during five years to check uh, where and how these uh, plastic waste arrive on, on the atoll. As uh, you probably know, Greenpeace has been investing a lot of time and, and, and money and energy on the, on the issue of plastic waste contamination in the oceans. Um, and they use the uh, sy um, symbol of uh, the whale. Um, a new NGO called For Ocean, for Ocean um, has even trans um, is even transforming and merchandising this waste um, to raise awareness on the issue. They produce this sort of uh, bracelet from recycled plastic. Um, in Taiwan, the novel published by Umini in 2011 described the plastic continent rushing on Taiwan's east coast. And I think this was quite kind of prophetic. If you think of the um, uh, last July, the, the, the uh, little Liu Kyu, uh, you know, near Kaohsiung, was submerged by, uh, by waste, uh, mostly plastic waste. 
and you know this is the habitat of uh, sea turtle. It's it's great to have a dive there uh, with turtles. Um, recently, I've seen this uh, uh, the exhibit in National Taiwan Museum of Fine Arts in in Taichung, and there was this beautiful work by Lin John Young, the the death of sperm whale, and uh, you know just um, the, the surprising to see that Taiwan. The whole Taiwan has become a plastic debris. But, well, so basically when we think of plastic waste uh, and their, their consequence for the, uh, the sea, um, um, sea life, we care for the whales or the turtle. But now I would like to finish with very, very small creature. Um, um, this um, colleague of mine is Machida Ryuji at uh, Academia Sinica. He's a specialist of plankton. Bentos and copepods are a small creature close to plankton, but he would say that it's totally different, but well, just to make it simple. And um, he's very much concerned now that uh, plastic, what we have seen with his, um, plastic bottles, those are uh, visible plastic, but you know uh, the, the problem of what we call microplastic. Microplastic are so small that even plankton, copepods and bentos can, can eat uh, uh, those plastic now. So he's concerned about that. And to show you why, why he's concerned about this, I would like to... Okay, doesn't matter. Uh, but it's very surprising how those... Uh, so Basically, he observed the sexual life of, of this plankton, not because he's uh, sexually obsessed, but because sex is a way of defining the species. Um, but it's very surprising how those bentos are very cute and looks very much like human. And, and, and they're, well, so he has a very hot video, but, well, okay, it's too bad. <laughs> um, so let me conclude with the, on a more positive note. Uh, I would like to introduce the research conducted by this young uh, Taiwanese. She dives in the corals to record the, the voice of small fish. And this I have here, I can... I would like you to listen a little bit. Oh. Oh. I don't know how to stop. Anyway. Um. <laughs> okay, tell me to. So she hasn't uh, finished her research yet, so we don't know what those fish are telling to one another, uh, but it reminds me what marine biologists name the school of fish. Uh, the marine biologists observe that group of small fish can avoid being eaten by predators if they stick together, but the risk of being eaten increases if they are separated from the school or if they don't move fast enough together in different directions to confuse the predator's attack. Uh, I guess you guys know about this, but um, I think this could be a metaphor of Taiwan critical zone or the two meanings of geopolitics. The first meaning is, uh, as defined by uh, Bruno Latour, is our ecology is vulnerable to uh, uh, climate change and other, and the Anthropocene or the sixth extension and so on. The second meaning, and this is more, uh, um, in, um, this is really meaningful for countries like Taiwan, uh, ecology is vulnerable. So are democracy and small nations like Taiwan that are threatened by big predators like China. So I think we can think of Taiwan at, with different layers of critical zone um, within the uh, international community and within Taiwan. Um, so yeah, basically it's, it's uh, what I aim to, to, to mean. Thank you very much for your kind attention.
，非常谢谢保罗哈。呃，从敏感地带，呃，谈到这个呃性生活哈，就是呃浮游生物哈，或者是海绵宝宝的性生活啊，那么当然就是。因为他最后那个什么没有播出来，那个 sexual life or p r a n t o n 他那个，呃，有另外一个意思，就是一个意义是说是浮游生物哈，他去研究说这些细致的这种生物的这种繁殖呃繁衍的如何形成一种生态脆弱性的一个症状，啊，那么一直当然他谈的话，就是说就台湾。呃呃呃，这个怎么样？作为一个呃呃民主政体呢，它实际上呃就是也很容易啊，在这个呃呃整个星球的呃呃呃、哎、生态的脆弱性当中呢，事实上呢，它本身也是会变成是一个容易被牺牲的一个角色啊。那从这个角度来讲，我们刚刚看到，比如说像现在在这个呃呃呃。呃呃那个什么台中的这个呃呃呃反空污的抗争当中呢，我们也看到哈，就是说呃反对党哈，就是国民党的呃台中市候选人呢，也上台来支持呃台中的反空污运动哦。那当然这个是一个非常好的现象哈，选候选人呢总是会在选前呢啊选他对的方向来呃支持哈，包括蔡文灿他讨。县长啊，之前呢，事实上是要保护早教的啊。那选上了之后呢，他就是反对保护早教。那现在呢，啊，高雄市的反对党候选人，台中市的反对党候选人都站出来反空污哈。那我们就看看说，选后他们到底要站在哪一边？那么选前、选后啊，还有包括说所有的执政者只有四年这样子的一个任期的情况之下呢，其实。呃四呃四年的民主呢，事实上是一种政体本身的一种脆弱性。那个就是说民主的脆弱性呢，呃，在这里头呢，事实上就会反映在在这个我们对于呃所谓的生态。呃呃呃，环境的这个脆弱这上面哈，因为已经没有政府愿意长期的啊去担保呃环境的永续性哈，生态的永续性哈，所以呃选民们就需要更加努力哈，不管在选前选后。那么呃，本来刚刚呃呃吴玛丽老师呢，策展人呢，呃，希望我说也是做一个简单的报告，我们是不是把我的那个。呃呃，提上来一下哈，就是说我个人呢，作为一个策展人，还有就是说哲学工作者呢，那在过去几年呢，也非常非常关注着这个呃环境生态的议题。那从呃二零零八年台北双年展呃的时候呢，我已经邀请那时候是一个呃呃，就是说反全球化呃运动的一个一个呃双年展呢。那时候实际上我是邀请这个呃吴玛丽老师呢做了一个关于生态啊的方面的一个作品哈。那今年呢呃这个什么十年之后呢啊呃呃呃玛丽变成策展人了，那他邀我来做一个这样子的一个 presentation。那在过去几年呢，事实上我一直就是说继续的在做。这个议题上面的一个探讨，那作为呃哲学工作者跟策展人来说的话呢，我们会比较关心一个，就是说呃，除了政治经济学，或者是说这个呃所谓的地缘政治的这种切入的方式之外，呃，我们怎么样子从呃呃哲学，甚至于说对于美学这一方面的一个关切呢，啊、呃，来切入这个生态的一个议题哈，那么。呃，我在过去呃两年呢，事实上做了几档展览，都跟这个议题有关系的哈，就是所谓的南方，好，或者是说整个呃呃，就是说星球的这种城市化过程当中呢，环境议题到底是什么？然后呢，包括说人的整个身体跟感官知觉的这些结构呢，在这个过程当中形产生什么样子的变化？好，那么当然，现在越来越多人了解到，就是说，啊，这个所谓的城，所谓的都市化的一个现象呢，事实上是整个，呃呃，这地表这样子蔓延开来的哈。那所以，其实已经没有任何一个城市，事实上是孤立于其他城市，啊，包括说台北市在内哈。
。所以就是说，这个过程当中，我们当然是说，人跟环境呢，很可能是会都会被城市被牺牲的一个对象。啊，我们今天啊看到刚刚保罗也提到哈、啊，就是说，比如说在台湾的这个呃呃矿呃呃矿区的挖掘上面呢，事实上呢有百分之八十是呃呃呃占据在原住民的呃呃这个什么样领域当中啊，那可是呢原住民事实上他就是连百分之二的人口而已啊，那这些事情实际上就是意义的，就是说呃呃在所谓的这种呃现代化的牺牲体系。之下，啊，被牺牲的事实上是呃呃环境资源，还有在这些呃呃环境生态之上面的所居住的一些人哈，啊，那当然整个在这个什么就是说呃呃呃，啊呃呃,呃这个生态灾难的蔓延当中呢，实际上呢是刚刚保罗也说过哈、啊，就是说没有人是局外人哈，啊 ，there is no outsider。啊，那么从这个角度，我们当然可以讲说，实际上在整个这种呃人的演化过程当中呢，实际上我们应该把这个所谓的文化的这些差异呢，啊，重新回来啊，看到说事实上是这个什么是自然的一部分哈、啊。那当然这些事实上就是当今我们在讨论所谓的呃呃，说说后人文主义啊呃的这个怎么样，就是说的呃社会啊当中一个很重要的一个一个概念。好，好，那么，呃，我在去去呃去年呢，去年做了一个南方的一个展览，在高雄市立美术馆。啊，那么呃，其实比较提议的就是说，我们事实上呢，包括说现代人啊，作为一个城市的一个人来讲的话呢，实际上呢，已经变，已经是所谓的赛博格啊。我们的感官知觉呢，没办法脱离城市的生活现象，而且我们的身体本身没办法脱脱离，就是说，呃呃呃，科技啊，科技物质连接在人的身体这上面哈、啊。那么。所以呢，我们今天呃呃思考到环境的时候，事实上必须要重新去思考，说我们的感官知觉的现象发生了什么变化啊？你没办法，很多事情事实上你没办法透过你的眼睛，透过你的身体直接呢呃去进行感受。很多时候我们对于呃环境的感知呢，是必须要透过科技物。来啊，来产生的，包括说我们在这边看到的很多的展呃展览，呃这作呃作品呢，事实上必须要透过这种科科科技的这种感测器，好、啊，还有刚刚这个。呃呃呃呃呃，呃，保罗所这个什么举的那些例子哈，啊，就是说去感测呃呃生物圈，或者是说这个什么海底鱼群的这些声音，啊，或者是说呃进行这些海，就是说呃生物的这些实验哈。那我我要强调的就是在于说呢。呃呃，就当代的人来说的话呢，我们没办法凭着我们自己本身的感官知觉去理解这样子的一个世界的一个一个变化啊。虽然我们随时我们的身体在呃呃。这个不断的消失的退后退的过程当中呢，啊，比如说 PM 二点五来了哈，你可能会觉得只是呼吸困难而已，而实际上它已经改变你整个身体的这种新陈代谢的结构啊。那我在过去呃呃几年当中观察到的台湾的很多的这个什么艺术创作者呢，啊，都有这样子的一个也呃研究的一个，就是说。啊的一个方式啊，以及就是说啊，如何啊，透过就是长期的拍摄摄影机的拍摄观察，以结再结合科学的研究啊，那来就是说这个什么做的这些纪录片哈、啊，包括我们今天呢，呃，在这个展览当中的呃柯柯导演哈、啊，柯师傅呢，他做的长期做的这些研究呢，啊，跟这个什么。呃，记录也都是非常重要的哈。那么这几件的作品哈，包括像这个什么，呃，黄老师跟曹老师呢，他们的作品在楼上哈。那这个是去年在呃呃南方啊、呃、高雄那个南方展览里面啊、呃、展出的一些啊、呃、一些呃呃呃场场景哈。啊，那么。
，啊，有对这些有兴趣的朋友呢，实际上呢，呃、网络上还有很多的资料啊。那我特别强调的就是说，呃，在这样子的一个过程当中，人的跟这个什么跟呃呃环境生态关系呃产生变化之后，我们的感知经验重新呃组织了之后呢，我们怎么样子来呃讨论啊啊艺术的影像，当代艺术的这些影像。啊，那变成是一个我们今天呢，在做这个什么样，呃呃呃，就是说这一类型的呃呃议题的时候呢，啊，一个很重要的一个一个一个部分哈、啊。那我很简单的就是报告到呃这个地方。那最后呢，我提到了一个就是说，呃，它背后其实是一个啊，今天我们今天在面对这些环境议题的时候。啊，我们必须要重新调整我们的宇宙论，调整我们人的这个身体哈，我们的存有学啊。那我特别关注的呢，就是说我们如何从呃古代哲学，像比如说像道家啊的哲学呢啊来呃呃重新理解说当今呃文化，就是说我们生态的议题这上面呢呃呃的长远的一种连结性哈。啊那么这个是我去也是一样是吧？去年南方展览里面呢，徐永进老师的一个呃呃啊一个呃书法哈、啊。那呃我呢呃就把这个什么，就是说我我认为就是很快的啊，把这个所谓的这个呃当代面对环境议题的时候背后的呃一种呃呃纯有学跟这个什么宇宙论呢呃就啊放在这边。那我呢就报告到这里。好，谢谢。我提一个问题，就是因为我觉得呃 p a 把那个呃，关于这个环境保护跟呃抵抗运动，尤其是就是政治放在一起啊。不过有一点把它比较放在一个地方的政治抵抗运动来看啊，那当然那一块是很重要。可是我觉得。呃，当我们在谈环境议题，它环境议题的时候，它其实是一个更大的政治。那那个政治就是地缘政治啊，然后还有就是说，在这种强权，呃的这种呃分配之下，例如说，我觉得台湾最大的困境是在于，或者是包含。亚洲或者东南亚这些国家，我们最大的困境就是在于面对欧美这一些强势的经济体，我们基本上扮演的就是一个生产的角色。所以我觉得在欧美中心，他们在谈环境，呃呃，他们谈环境的方式，事实上是我们完全没有办法那样谈的。哈，那这个也是在。我们这一次双联展，其实是我非常意识到的一个问题，因为，因为呃，共同策展人是一个来自欧洲的人，那么欧洲人在想环境的时候，呃，跟我们处在一个呃，像这样子一个东南亚处境，呃呃，就是说我们等于是一个比较后来才开始现代化的区域，然后在这些年，呃，又为了追求这个经济的进步。所以我们在全球的这个整个经济的模式里面，我们其实是扮演着这个生产基地的角色。那生产的场域，事实上，它其实是呃，就要承受很多的污染、呃，环境破坏，甚至于这个资源的呃剥削、被剥削的这些课题啦。所以我我只是想要问的就是说。当然，我们刚刚看的政治是比比较是台湾的地方政治啦。那你如果是作为从一个地缘政治来看的话，我们又如何去跟这个非常欧美中心的那种所谓的环境主义去对话？哎，就是我想问的。好，好。Which both I I I, I 我我我要用什么语言？中文吗？中文可以吗？好，那那讲到这个，就是想我是法国来的，但是住在台湾十年了，所以我我不能说我已经变成台湾人，但是也可以说我我被台湾人污染了，<笑>所以哦、嗯，就是。在我的日常的行动上，我我有很多矛盾，就是比如说我今天我很后悔，因为我有忘记带我的保温瓶，啊
，就刚发现哦，我有点渴，但是我很想喝，但是，干我不能喝，因为这个是苏桥，<笑>所以，呃，这个跟你的问题没有直接关系，但是我意思是说，我们要怎么定义什么是啊、呃？你刚听呃，怎么说呃，呃，西方怎么样怎么样，呃，台湾的地方政治怎么样怎么样？我其实我我我会有困难呃，嗯、呃，分析我们在哪一章，然后我还好，我很高兴今天早上我有我有去游泳一下，因为就 refresh， 然后我在游游泳就有一个那个我刚刚有在我的 PPT 加进来那个 the three layers of critical， zone， 这个是我早上猜出来，我想啊，猜猜有那个。再有一个 issue of， 啊、呃，那个敏感区的集中层，是不是也也刚，徐先生有提到，呃，什么文化是真，这自然的一部分，哈、哦，那那个一样的问题，在文化有多怎么样的层？你你在讲的是台湾的文化、西方的文化，这样你可能你不在乎，是不是你不在乎？我我也一样，我不在乎，但是有时候我们不能不在乎，所以我我对我虽然我觉得那个拉兔的那个敏感区的概念，非常就是很有趣的部分，就是推动我们超过这些国国家主义，就是 narrow nationalism 的定的那个过境，呃，但是另外一方面就是像到台湾这么。可怜的，在那个国际上的情况，我是我们我们不能不关心那个这种深的问题 ，problem of layers。我我不知道有没有回答你的问题，有可能徐先生可以补充一下。我想补充一下，就是说，呃，其实这里头当然涉及很深刻的这一种地缘政治的议题在上面哈，也就是说。呃，在今天，不管是说在联合国的层次，或者甚至于说，呃，也就是说这个什么全球呃生态呃呃呃这种共同决定的层次这上面来讲的话呢，其实、呃、台湾能够扮演的角色非常的弱。啊，那同时从从，因为你刚刚说的，从生产的角色来讲的话呢，呃，常常呢，台湾事实上是扮演高污染生产者，呃，这样子的一个角色哈。我们从呃台塑，呃，可以一直到讲台湾的这种玻璃高，这这种层，就是说。呃呃呃，高端玻璃的制造，一直到这个呃怎么样，新竹工业园区所产生出来的各式各样的污染，啊，那么呃，作为生产国来说的话呢，啊，就是说我们台湾不管讲说自己本身的这个经济如何提升，啊，这一类型的生产如何啊。呃呃呃，降低它的环保的这个 impact 啊，这个影响呢，事实上一直当然是一个台湾呃呃经济的一个议题。可是呢，就是说，就对我对于台湾的民族主义来讲的话，就变成说，你的经济的独立性要呃很高的自主性的时候，你往往就必须要仰赖这一类型的高污染的。啊，这一种生产哈、啊，那么这里头的仰赖当中呢，很多时候，呃呃呃，政府以及民间企业给出的一个呃呃论证，往往就是说，你没有这一类型的高污染的产业，你就不可能有经济的独立性。啊，这个经济的独立性呢，保障了台湾呢的政治的一个独立性。啊，那我觉得这样子一个论证，很多时候呢，事实上，呃呃，都必须要进行更细致的这种讨论，而且就是说，啊，那个细致讨论当中，很大部分实际上是一个价值的选择的问题。啊，就我们现在最近呢，这个这一次的这个空投呃公投当中啊，到底要选择呃以核养绿那个假的议题啊，或者是更细致的去讨论说，比如说大潭早礁跟台湾的啊产业
啊，所需要的电力，这个关系到底到到什么程度啊？那大潭早教呢，事实上是一个很好的一个例子啊，就是说。呃呃，你今天某些产业影响到人的生命安全跟这个呃呃呃呃，比如说像空气污染的时候，你会觉得人会站起来反对，对。可是你如果说电力的生产影响到不会讲话的大谈早教的话，啊，大部分的时候事实上呢，那样子的一个啊呃呃生态呢就会被牺牲掉。啊，所以我们现在回来，事实上不只是在呃选择一个说更健康的呃生活啊，说哎我不会有呃核能的这种核灾的威胁啊，或者是说我不会为了电力而需要吸这些空气啊，还有另外一个不选择就是说我们要生活在什么样子的地球上面，一个有大潭早礁的地球，还是一个没有大潭早礁的地球，因为大潭早礁没有选票，呃、啊、没有选票。啊，他不会讲话，他不会走上街头，啊，那所以呢，这个事实上是在这个议题上面，当然是一个，就是说我们呃，对于我们生活价值的一个选择哈、啊。所以我觉得就是说，这个是一个例子了，也就是说呢，其实他背背后对民主的挑战，往往是在于说，呃、啊，很多时候，呃呃呃，国际呃国际的这种经济的这种呃呃阶层的分配当中呢，你好像被迫必须要选择。一种经济跟另外一种经济，可是呢，背后里头还有很多更细致的东西呢，我们必须要去呃呃明了的哈。也就是说，你要选择一个有核灾威胁的生命，还是要选择没有的？还是你要选择有大潭早教的啊生态的一个地球，跟选择一个没有大潭早教生态的一个地球？所以我觉得那个是一个价值选择的问题哈。所以在这个层次来讲的话，我觉得是说，即使在台湾。啊，一个啊小小的可爱的宝岛式上面来讲的话，用刚刚用保罗的话啊 ，a little cute island 哈、啊，就是啊这个什么环保哈、啊、环境的宝岛，呃、啊、这样子的一个就角度来说的话呢，实际上很大部分还是仰赖在说，呃台湾人呢，呃、啊、或者生活在台湾的人呢，啊到底要选择什么样子的价值？事实上，它背后是一个价值的选择，是一个我刚刚说的，事实上是一个一个宇宙。论的一个选择，哈，我我的回应是这个样子。啊，好的，哎，后面好像有一个朋友有问题哈，我们就是最后一个问题。Sorry, maybe it's the last question. Um, when you talk about the nuclear power plant, uh, I very Obsessed and interested in that very much, um, because I go to Fukushima uh, area too, and I got this uh, many suffering from the people around that area after this uh, the phenomenon. But recently, this uh, this years a Chinese uh, movement uh, to further, I'm not sure this can call propaganda or not. Uh, I came from Thailand. Uh, the princess from Thailand got invited to visit, uh, not sure this which region, but uh, Chinese gift to come back for the president to Thailand. I think you, you know already the tokamak, what this is. It's nuclear fusion reactor. Uh -huh. So maybe it's kind of a propaganda to take over uh, all region because Chinese gonna open the new games about the nuclear power plant, clean nuclear in everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I, I'm not sure, I, I, I'm not very uh, well aware of what you mentioned, but it reminds me that uh, China has also this tremendous idea of uh, developing um, floating power plant, nuclear power plants in the South China Sea, and this is part of their strategy to colonize the South China Sea. So when you think about that and how the, already the tremendous um, destruction of marine life in the South China Sea, uh, it's just, yeah, um, yeah, no, basically I, I, I agree with what you said, but it's just, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. 好的
。那我们呢这一场就先到此为止哈，因为呃，我想这些呃的讨论还会继续再延续。那下一场呢，我们就有几个呃艺术家呢来这边呢给我们做他们的 presentation。那这个呢就非常谢谢保罗给我们做这个很好的 presentation。谢谢。